So good to be back at Bellevue, and uh, Steve's become a great friend. He's just such a great pastor, and uh, you do pray for him this weekend. He has a, he has a tough job. Uh, I am a psychologist by training. They thought you might need a psychologist today with all that's going on, and so uh, I actually worked at a mental health clinic. I was a, a staff psychologist. I left the mental health clinic. One reason I left the mental health clinic, I couldn't tell the staff and the patients. Uh, except the staff had the keys. Other than that, I couldn't tell, you know, the, 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 the staff seemed to have as many problems as the patients had. And so I have had a unique life. One week I worked at a mental health clinic and the next week I worked at a Baptist church. Uh, people say, was that a big adjustment? And I say, no, the staff still had the keys. Brother than that, I couldn't tell a whole lot of different. Uh, uh, but I'll actually be honest with you. I got tired of being a psychologist. I mean, I, I, I got tired of listening. I mean, I just got tired of listening. I got tired of saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I understand how you feel that way. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, I reached a point where I thought, why am I doing the listening and they're doing the talking? I got a doctor's degree and they're seeing a psychologist. They don't know anything. What? Why don't I do some talking? Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? It, it wasn't a good idea. It, 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 it didn't go well at all. You know, it, it would go something like this. The guy would say, the reason I'm a loser is because my dad was an alcoholic. And I'd say, well, there's another way of looking at this. Maybe your dad's an alcoholic because you're a loser. I mean, there's another way of looking at it. Uh, people will not pay for that, you understand. They won't pay for that, and so they decided to move on. So uh, let me see if I can explain to you the best way, uh, what I do. Here's the best way I can explain it. How many remember when the only thing you had to play with was the outside? Anybody remember that? The outside. You know, uh, uh, for some of you, this is going to sound like the History Channel, but, but uh, uh, the, the outside. Actually, it's, it was easier and, and uh, now to travel with your grandkids than it was with my kids. Now grandkids, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a piece of cake. I, I mean, they just get in the car and they do this the whole time, you know, and then we're here, oh good, and they get out. I, I mean, uh, matter of fact, I told my grandson the other day, why don't you come over to my house and we'll have some quality time and I'll watch you stare at your iPhone. You know, just you know, kind of, you know, have some time together. Uh, uh, but when, I was, when our kids were young, the only thing we had was the outside, right? So, so we had to count cars. Remember that? You had to count Volkswagens, and you had to uh, count cows and, and letters and signs. And, and, and after about 50 miles, you're done. You know, you're done. You know, but they're still in the back seat, you know. So they're saying things like, she's breathing my air, you know, stuff like that. Uh, uh, I used to tell my wife, any trip over 100 miles, I know why animals eat their young, you know, because this isn't good. This isn't good. Uh, uh, but, but times have changed. I mean, now, you know, we're, we're grandparents, but now you, you, don't, you don't call yourself grandparents anymore. I mean, so, uh, especially the women, they come up with these cute names, you know. You don't hear grandma anymore, you know. My, so, so my wife picked Mimi. Okay, Mimi. What, what's that? What am I going to be, PP? You know, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, 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 so I said, I don't care if you are Mimi. I'm Papa. All right, I'm Papa. Uh, uh, so when I was a kid, the only thing we had was the outside. So we played marbles. Anybody remember marbles? You named them. You know, you named your marbles. Roly Poly and Black Beauty and Steely. You named your marbles. Well, my dad was a Baptist preacher. I actually grew up at the church. I lived in a parsonage at the church. I grew up at the church. That's why I became a psychologist, you understand? Uh, I lived at the church. And so, uh, I, uh, uh, so dad was a Baptist preacher. You could play marbles, but you can't play for keeps. Remember that? Can't play for keeps. Too much like gambling, and we're Baptists, so we're pretty much against everything, you know? You know? Yeah. If it's fun, you can't do it. If it tastes good, spit it out, you know. And so uh, I, uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty more, I, I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. So I understand it. You know, I understand it. Uh, so my dad says you can play marbles, but you can't play for keeps. So what did I do? I played for keeps. You know, I'm a kid, you know. I disobeyed. I, I, you know, kid, I know more. You know, I don't play for keeps. I don't care what my dad said. I'm playing for keeps. You know? uh, 
And then there's always somebody in the neighborhood, somebody bigger, somebody stronger, and they would threaten you or even hit you, and, and, and they would cheat or and then maybe just steal your marbles. And then I realized I've lost my marbles. <laughs> I, I've lost my marbles. Well, well how, how am I going to get my marbles back? Well, I had to go back to my dad. I had to tell him the truth. I disobeyed. And then my dad, was a, was a, he's a good dad. He'd go confront the bully, sometimes the bully's dad, and, and I got my marbles back. Well, that's what I do. I go around the country, lots of people, <laughs> some of you, <laughs> you've lost your marbles. you lost your marbles. <laughs> and I'll tell you how good your heavenly father is and how you got to face it to fix it, all right? You can't, secrets are sickness. Got to tell the truth. But if you tell the truth, you get your marbles back. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get some marbles back. Now understand, they only give me like 35 minutes. I can't get all of your marbles back, all right? You know, uh, but we just get as many as we can, many as we can. And today we're going to get marbles back in the area of relationships because relationships will give you the most pleasure in life, but will also have the most pain in your life. Here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. For the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. It's not good to be alone. You read any psychological profile of anybody that does anything strange, weird, perverted, you'll usually see a phrase and it says, this person was a loner. It's not good to be alone. End up being strange, weird, maybe even perverted. It's, and it's especially not good for men to be alone. Uh, let, let me, uh, uh, research shows that single men go in the prison and the state hospital a lot more than married guys. Okay, uh, let, me, let me just stop here and encourage you married guys. How many, how many married guys in here? You got any married guys? Let, let me encourage you right, right here. I, I don't know how your marriage is going, but let's look at it in a positive way. It's keeping you out of prison. It's keeping you out of the state hospital. Now, that's encouraging, isn't it? You know, that's encouraging. Uh, you ought to thank your wife right now. Thank you for keeping me out of prison, the state hospital. Uh, and one reason it keeps you out of the state hospital is your wife will tell you when you're crazy, right? She'll, she'll say, you crazy. Don't do that anymore. They'll put you in a state hospital. Uh, so it's not good for man to be alone. So God created family. God created marriage. God created the church. The church is the family of God. See, God knew that this is a fallen world. You're going to have death, divorce, all kind of dysfunction. You're going to have people who choose to remain single. And God doesn't want anyone to be alone because you can't be all God wants you to be. So the church is the safety net, so no one will have to be alone. So everyone can become the person that God creates them to be. Now, why would this be the case? Why would God say it's not good for man to be alone? Because remember, this is before sin came into the world. So Adam had a perfect spiritual relationship with God. And it's God who said, even if you had a perfect spirit, you can't be all I want you to be by yourself. You, you have to be around other people to complete you to be all I had in mind when I created you. Well, why would that be the case? Because a lot of people, they say, well, all I need is God. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you need other people to complete you. If you think about it, it makes sense. Because we also, the Bible says, we are made in the image of God. Now, that's encouraging, isn't it? Now, now, that image has been defaced because of the fall of man, but it's not been erased. You have some of the characteristics God has. Well, what is God like? Well, if you read the Bible, God is three personalities. He is Father, He is Son, and He is Holy Spirit. Uh, if you grew up in church, you probably heard that referred to as the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is one of those heavenly concepts hard to understand down here on earth. If, if people tell you they totally understand the Trinity, they will lie about other stuff too. I promise you, they don't totally understand the Trinity. And although I don't understand it, I accept it, and I can actually relate to it. When, when my kids were young, the cousins would come over and visit, and the cousins would call me Uncle Charles. 
And my girls would look at those cousins and say, he's not your Uncle Charles, he's my daddy. And they'd say, no, he's not, he's Uncle Charles. Well, no, he's daddy, he's Uncle Charles, he's daddy. And they would get in a little tiff over that. Why? In their childish brain, they couldn't understand how I could be two personalities at the same time. How could you be Uncle Charles and Daddy? That doesn't make any sense. In my childish brain, I can't understand how God could be three personalities at the same time. But for some reason, God the Father needed God the Son in order to do the work of salvation, and God the Son needed God the Holy Spirit in order to make His love permanent in our lives. And then it says we are made in the image of God. So what does that mean practically? Here's what it means. It means because God has different personalities, we need to be around different personalities because we are made in His image to complete us because we are not divine like God. I mean, we have the same creative capacity, but we will create in a dysfunctional way. Uh, matter of fact, I would be the first to say, you can actually create your own personalities. <laughs> matter of fact, we have a diagnosis for that. We call that multiple personality disorder, and we will put you in a state hospital if you do it that way. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to be around other personalities to complete you so you can be the person that God created you to be. Well, how does it work? Well, let me give you some practical application of how it all works. I've always been practical. Even when I was in private practice, I was very practical. One of my first patients couldn't remember anything. I said, when did your problem start? He said, I can't remember. I said, how long has it been going on? He said, I can't remember. I said, what have you done about it? He said, I can't remember. Doc, I can't remember anything. What do I do? I said, here's what you do. You pay me in advance. That's what you do. Uh, <laughs> Always been very practical, you understand? Uh, so let me teach you some practical things about relationships. Relationships work in stages. Most of life, if you think about it, works in different stages. And depending on what age and stage of life you're in will depend on what your needs are and what your relationship needs are. For example, my wife and I, we're in that empty nest stage of life. You know, people say, when does life really begin? I can tell you when life really begins. It's when the kids leave home and the dog dies. That's pretty much when life really begins. Uh, 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 but your needs will change. You know, uh, for, for example, uh, I got this buddy of mine. He's, he's, an, he's an old guy. I can't say old nowadays. He's, he's chronologically gifted. He's about you know, he's about 90, you know, and, and he's, he's dating this lady that's 80, you know, and, and so his buddies, of course, are giving him a hard time and say, well, why are you, are you going to marry her? He said, yes, I'm going to marry her. He said, well, well, does she have a lot of money? Well, no, she doesn't have a lot of money. Well, does she have a nice house? Well, no. Well, she have a nice car? Well, it's okay. Well, can she cook? No, she doesn't cook. Say, well, why are you marrying her? He says, I'm marrying her because she can drive at night. That's why I'm marrying her. Uh, uh, so so your, your needs are going to change a little bit depending on how old you are. You understand? Uh, uh, matter, matter of fact, I I ran into him, and he, I said, how did it go? He said, well, I, I really had to ask her two questions. I said, two questions? He said, yeah. I got on my knees, and I said, will you marry me? And then I said, could you help me back up? You know, so it's just going to be a little different. Uh, but the first stage of any relationship is the wonderful stage. And, and this pretty much applies not just relationships to life. Remember the first job you really wanted? and you sent out your resume, or maybe you got some guys to recommend you, or gals, and, and, you, and you thought you had found the perfect job. I mean, you're going to get off for this, they're going to pay for this, you get to do this, and it is until you go to work, right? You know, and then, well, I didn't know about this, and they didn't tell me about that. Well, that's the way life is. You find the perfect friend, and they are to get to know them. Everybody's normal to get to know them. And then, well, I didn't know they did this, and I didn't know they did that. Well, that's especially true of relationships, especially when you add the romantic factor, you know, the urge to merge factor. You know, when one gland's calling out to another gland, let's get together. You know that stage of life. And by the way, that's a beautiful stage of life to be in, but it's a pitiful stage to watch, isn't it? You know, uh, I used to do premarital counseling, and I quit doing it because I just got sick of looking at it. You know, I, I, 
I, I just wanted to say, take your hands off each other and listen to me. You know, uh, I'd try to shock them into reality, like have a job, no. Finish school, no. Got any money, no. How you gonna live, love. You know? And then they jump on each other again. You know that stage. I wanted to say I give you five years for this body chemistry to turn to toxic waste, you know. Uh, uh. But I'm a nice guy, so I say, why don't you register paper plates at Toys R Us or something? Because they don't know what you're doing, you know. You don't know what you're doing. Uh. And by the way, the principles that we teach are principles that last. You know, the world is a Ponzi scheme. The world is always telling you things that don't last, you see. The world is always telling you you can have this without that. And you can have this without that for a short period of time. Usually by the time the that shows up, you're addicted to the this, you know. But God gives you principles that last for lifetimes. Uh, I'm in airports a lot because I, I speak around the country and I have to fly. And my arms get tired, so I go to airports. And so... Uh, you ever, you ever see the people movers in airports? You ever see them? They, they, they got, es- you know, they're like horizontal escalators, and they'll go fast. I mean, those people movers, you can get moving, and they're moving. You ever see them? You know, you move, they move. Man, I like them. I like them. When they are people. I like those people movers, man. But I'm, I'm at the airport late at night usually, and there's usually a ball team, you know, like a, 17-year-old boys, you know, some kind of team. And by the way, the IQ of 17-year-old boys is about like plant life. You know, it, it's like uh, uh, you, you watch 17-year-old boys make decisions, you think, can an IQ test come back negative? I mean, you know, uh, 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 17-year-old boys say things like this, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm joining the Marines. And so, uh, uh, that's just 17-year-old boys. That's what they do. Uh, so, so usually it's a, it's a team of like 17-year-old boys, and, and they decided to go down the people mover the wrong way. Why? Because they can. They're young, and they're quick, and they're going to go down the wrong way. And they can. I mean, because you know, they, they make some, you know, they, they have to work at it, you know. And they go, you know, they're making, you know, they're laughing, look at us. And it's pretty funny because they usually stop just before they get to the end to celebrate, you know. Oh, we, man, look at it, we're doing so good. They don't realize it's taking them all the way back, you know, all the way back. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people in the thousands that I've worked with over the years who they think they can live the life the way they want to live, that they know more than God. They want it, and they want their pleasure, and they want their whatever they want right now. And they can get away with it for a while. And then you run into them five, ten years later. They've lost their job, or they've lost their family, and kids don't want to be around them. They're addicted to something. And you realize the world's a Ponzi scheme. The world's kind of suck you in thinking, oh, you can have this, and that won't happen to you. It always does. So how how do we, let's practically deal with relationships. The first stage, of course, is that wonderful stage. And anybody can handle that stage. That's the temporary. That's the the short term. I mean, that's like going down to people moving the wrong way. Man, you got urge to merge, whatever she says. And that's great. That's wonderful. But after wonderful, after a certain period of time, comes war, doesn't it? I mean, all of a sudden, see, opposites attract from a distance, but opposites attack up close. You know, the, the very thing that attracted you from a distance now starts to irritate you up close. You know, uh, one reason I was attracted to my wife is not only is she beautiful, she was organized. I thought, man, that, that would be good because I'm not organized. I need somebody that's organized. I just didn't know how organized she was going to be, you know. I mean, I knew I was in trouble when she wanted to clean up the rice at the wedding before we went on the honeymoon. And I thought, man, this, this lady's clean. You know, she's clean, you know. Closets color-coded, shoes face north, you know. Uh, uh, put my Diet Coke down and turn around, and it's in the dishwasher. And, and I'm not even through with that yet, you know. Uh, put down the newspaper, it's gone. You know, I didn't even finish. I asked her one time, what do you think God's trying to teach me? He said, he's trying to teach you. Enjoy things while you have them. You never know when you're going to lose them. Uh, 
So we have those wars. We got those personalities. Sometimes it happens quickly. You know, guy got up on his honeymoon, turned to his sweet wife, says, where's my hot breakfast? Mother always made me a hot breakfast. She said, you want a hot breakfast? Put those Fruit Loops in the microwave. That'll, that'll, that'll be hot. <laughs> hey, buddy, set those cornflakes on fire. That'll warm you up. You know? We've all been there, so we have personality characteristics. And then we just have male-female differences. I mean, uh, it, it's a world that want to tell you there's not any male-female differences. There's male-female differences, I promise you. Uh, matter of fact, part of the problem with male communication is our brain's just different from females' brains. You know, they've actually done research where they played a novel to females and watched their brain light up. And every area of the brain lights up. You know, they got two hemispheres, and that corpus close-up in the middle, light, it's just going back and forth. Play a novel to a man, and only one side of the brain lights up when he's listening. Many of you ladies have been talking to a man and think, I am talking to somebody with half a brain. Uh, <laughs> and you're absolutely correct, you know. Uh, when it comes to communication, it's much more difficult for him. It, it's, it's, it's harder for him t- to do that. And so we have male-female difference. And men and women just grow up differently. See, women grow up learning how to cooperate. They learn how to communicate. They learn how to share. Men grow up competing. King of the hill, capture the flag, put a helmet on, seriously injure the other guy. That's how we grew up. You know? And sometimes women don't understand that competition. Remember the first vacation we went on, Penny said, can we stop at the rest area? I said, not till I pass that Chevrolet. <laughs> she said, what Chevrolet? Chevrolet passed me 30 miles back, that Chevrolet, you see. <laughs> so we go to war. And then we start to, to wonder. We wonder, did we take the wrong job? Wonder, did we join the wrong church? Even wonder, did we marry the wrong person? You know, uh, I'll have these guys come in and see me when I was in practice, they'd be all nervous, you know, looking around because they're seeing a psychologist. And I get nervous too. I mean, I've seen some strange people. When they look around, I look around. I mean, I don't know what they're looking for. Uh, One guy was so paranoid, he thought the people in front of him were were, uh, following him. Now, that's paranoia, you understand? So, uh, so, so finally, I'll lean forward and I say, what, what's your problem? He said, oh, doc, it's, it's terrible. I said, tell me, what is it? Yeah, it's terrible. I said, what is it? And he'll say something like this. Well, doc, I think I've married the wrong person. I said, that, that's your problem? That's it? He said, that's it. I said, hey, I got good news for you. Everybody else did too. What that you want to talk about? He said, what do you mean? I said, in a sense, everybody married the wrong person. You married that fantasy person, that perfect person. They look good. They smell good. They never go to the bathroom. You got a perfect person here. <laughs> and then you get married, you got a real person. They don't always look good, don't always smell good, spend their life in the bathroom. You got a real person here. <clears throat> but then here's what happens. We start comparing our reality with the fantasy. We all come from the Adams family. Remember Uncle Adam? Because of, because of that, we always want what we cannot have. We're, see, as a rule, man's a fool. When he's hot, he wants to cool. When he cool, he wants it hot. Always want what's not. As a rule, man's a fool. I mean, you know that, don't you? So we all want what we cannot have. And so we're always comparing. See, the world wants you to compare the facts of where you are with the fantasy that they can say will make you happy. These guys used to come into my office and they'd say, oh, Dr. Lowry, my, I'm falling in love with my secretary. She dresses better than my wife. She listens better. She's always got a good attitude. I said, hey, I got an answer for that. He said, what's that? I said, pay your wife, let her off at four o'clock. She'll be in a great mood, I promise you. <laughs> you start comparing things that can't be compared, you see. These ladies would say, oh, Dr. Lowry, if my husband would just listen the way you would listen, if he'd be compassionate the way you're compassionate, if he would look into my eyes when I talk the way you look into my eyes, I say, pay him $150 an hour like you're paying me. He'll look in your eyes when you talk. (laughs) You have two choices in life, my friend. Only two. You can tear up that fantasy that does not exist. And you can accept your mate, your kids, your church, your job as a gift of God. Or else you'll spend the rest of your life tearing up those people 
trying to make them look like a fantasy that does not exist, and you'll end up being a very miserable person. The fact of the matter is, relationships just take work. They take work. If the grass is green, because somebody's watered it, fertilized it, taken care of it. If the grass is green and nobody appears to be taking care of it, there's a septic tank somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? Life doesn't work like that. But here's the key, the foundation of all I teach. You cannot do the work of relationships unless you understand the worship of relationships. Relationships are not secular, they are spiritual. Jesus met a lady at the well. She had been married five times and was living with a guy. A lady thinking, surely I can find a man that will meet my needs, that will measure up. And Jesus says to her, and maybe he's saying to you, when are you going to realize another person will never measure up? Another person has the same problems you have. They have the same Adam suit you have. They can never love you unconditionally all the time. They can never give you total forgiveness, which you crave. And when you're looking for a person to do that, you're always going to be let down. You're always going to feel, he used the word, thirsty. And then he said this, let me give you living water. Let me give you something that actually will satisfy. Let me give you the unconditional love that you need, that total forgiveness that you crave. So you will be freed up to love, and to bless other people. You see, I believe that actually the way you treat people is the highest form of worship. The reason is because Jesus was the true worshiper. And the reason is because in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, talking to men, it says, men, if you don't dwell with your wife with understanding, your prayers are going to be hindered. You see, it's God who made it spiritual. It's God who says, The way you treat people comes from me, you see. Uh, We get to the idea sometimes that worship is singing or worship is coming to church. I mean, this is great uh, singing, and and this is great preaching. you got one of the greatest preachers in America. But worship happens more when you leave than when you come in. Why? Because Jesus was the true worshiper. And what did he do? Out there, he blessed people the way God wanted them to be blessed. He loved people the way God wanted them to be blessed. You see, you come and you hear the word to encourage you to go out there and bless. You see, here's why that's crucial. Because that's the way it all started. Remember Abraham was called out? And God said, Abraham, I'm going to call you out. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you and through you, I'm going to bless the entire earth. And now we're all because of Jesus Christ and that Abraham's covenant. And 1 Peter chapter 3 is just another way of saying 1 Peter chapter 2. It's teaching us to live the way Jesus lived in chapter 2. So it's saying likewise, the way Jesus lived, here's the way you live. And it said to men, don't let your prayers be answered. But then verse 8, it says to all of us, when people do evil against you, you don't do evil back. Even when people revile against you, you don't revile back. Contrary, different than the way you would think it would be. This is the way it is. Contrary to doing evil when people do evil, I want you to bless them. Why? Because that's why you were called. And when you bless them, you will obtain a blessing from me. You see, we think we're going to bless people because they're going to bless us back. Uh, the, let's just say uh, I'm going to bless Drew. See, I'm going to bless Drew. I'm going to bless him. Bless, bless Drew. I'm blessing Drew. See me blessing Drew? Blessing Drew over there. He's feeling blessed, 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 isn't he? I'm blessing old Drew. I like I'm blessing him. I've been blessing him a long time now. Bless, bless, bless. You know, I'm blessing him, blessing him. See me? I'm bless, bless, blessing him. Bless some more. Bless some more. I'm blessing him. But after a while, I start thinking, now when's he going to bless me back? And I start saying things like, you know, after all I've done for Drew, I start to get resentful. It's 
not the way life works, my friend. Some people may never be able to bless you back. You ever had, you ever had an abscessed tooth or something, unbelievable pain? I had an abscessed tooth one time. It hurt so much when I walked, and I could feel the throbbing. Now, was I trying to think of somebody else? No. Was I trying to serve somebody else? No, I was after. It was all about me. Why? Because I was in too much pain. There's many people out there in so much emotional pain, all they can think about is themselves. And they'll never bless you back. I, I guarantee there's one in your family. Every, every family tree has a sap. You got at least one in your family. Uh, <laughs> but you, you're not blessing them so they can bless you back. You're blessing them because God says, I will bless you back. I will take care of you. Treating people has to be an act of worship. And here's the reason. Because people need love the most when they least deserve it. Let me tell you about my wife. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be in the second service. Uh, let me tell you about my wife. She's packing so we can get out of the hotel. Uh, you know, the women have to do the work and I just show up. It's, uh, but. Tell me about my wife. When she's in a good mood and things are going well and there's money in the bank and the grandkids are doing good and the schedule's full and people are buying my books, which I'd appreciate if you would. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty easy to love my wife. But you know, she doesn't need my love that much. You know when she needs my love? She's in a stinking mood. No money in the bank. The grandkids are messing up. The schedule's empty, nobody buying any books, and I say something nice to her, and she says something grumpy back to me. That's when she really needs my love, and that's when I really don't want to give it to her. <laughs> I want to say, stick it in your ear, lady. I deserve better than this. but I can do it as an act of worship. You see, I can love her when she's a jerkette. Why? Because God loved me when I was a jerk. That's why. She can love me when I'm a jerk. Why? Because God loved her when she's a jerkette. See, that's why we've been married over 40 years. That's why we've married the rest of our lives. That's why we grow and break our hips together. Why? Because <laughs> we see it as an act of worship got to wrap this thing up. I've told you a lot of things. Most of it you already know. It's not about knowing what to do. It's having the power to do it. Just about everybody I've worked with. You take a drug addict, he wants to get off drugs. He just don't know how to do it. He doesn't have the power to do it. I want to tell you there's power in the name of Jesus. I, uh, I got this series out about raising kids. I describe what it's like for a kid to go to the grocery store. You ever, you, ever, you ever seen a kid in the grocery store, they take him and they stick him in this iron seat, and they say, now, kid, I'm going to stick him in this iron seat. I'm going to roll you up and down the aisle, kid. You're going to see all the wonderful things God ever made, kid. But, kid, you don't get any of this stuff, kid. But me, I'm going to get anything I want, kid. And not all that, kid, I'm going to make you sit on everything I get. It's going to be a great day, you know. <laughs> well, kids don't do well in grocery stores. A lady heard that series in Mobile, Alabama communicated to us that that's exactly what happened to me. I was running late. I stuck that kid in the iron seat. I said, I got 30 minutes to get groceries. I don't want to hear a word out of you and start pushing up down the aisle, piling stuff on. That little boy just watching all that stuff. Watching all that stuff. <laughs> said he got about the third aisle. I said, Mama, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, sit down. Got two aisles over. Maybe remember those cookies? Sit. I told you to sit. About four aisles over. One cookie. Sit down. We're almost done. They get to the checkout. She said, I'm, you know, trying to get to the checkout. And I looked down, his eyes light up. You know, she said, I knew something was coming. I didn't know what. She said, all of a sudden, he stood straight up in his iron seat, put his hands toward heaven and said, in the name of Jesus, give me some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> she says, the place erupted in applause. They just kept clapping. <laughs> she said, I didn't know what to do. I ran and got the chocolate chip cookies. <clears throat> Now, what can we learn from a four-year-old boy? <laughs> a couple of things. One is when you get to check out, and you will get to check out, my friend. Death runs in my family. I think it runs in yours, right? Pretty much come in this world, no teeth, no hair, no bladder control. That's pretty much how you're going out. You're going to die. 
It's a short trip from diapers to the pens, I promise you. <laughs> when you get to checkout, make sure you know Jesus. It's not about how good you can do. It's not about how much you read your Bible. It's not about, how all, it's not about you at all. It's about what Jesus did for you. Make sure you accept Christ because he lived the life you'll never be able to live. <laughs> he died the death so you could be in his forever family. All he ever wanted was a family, and he's included you. Make sure you know Jesus. And then secondly, most of us probably are Christ followers. Some of you are in relationships or in situations, and the emotion of love is dead. I would ask you to call on the name of Jesus, because this Jesus has been known to bring dead things back to life. See, I've worked with people who said they didn't love each other. They call on the name of Jesus, and now they love each other. There's power in the name of Jesus. Thank you. We're going to have a time of invitation, a time for you to respond. I don't know what God said to you today. Maybe for the first time, God's given you the faith to believe that you would accept Christ today. Others may just need to come and kneel or just thank God for the people in your life and decide that I'm going to be a blessing in this world. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do it the way Jesus asked me to do it. You see, you, you, can, you can find Jesus and that'll get you to heaven, but my friend, you follow Jesus, you'll have a little bit of heaven down here on earth. You'll have things you never dreamed. It is the best life possible. Others of you may have needs I don't know about, but I promise you this, nobody ever regrets coming to God's altar. It's a place of grace and healing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. During this hymn of invitation, you speak to your people. Uh, let them know that there are people here, down front and then up in the, the balcony that are willing to help them, to pray with them, to encourage them, that no one needs to be alone. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. The pastors will be down front. They'll be on each ends of the balcony. You come if God's spoken to you today.